Welcome everyone to an In Conversation With. My name is Emma Smith and I'm delighted to be in conversation this morning with Kate Swaffer. Hi Kate. Hi Emma, thanks for having me. You're very welcome. I've got an additional tail in the screen today so that's just <laughs> looks a bit bizarre. Um, so just so you all know, um, in, I'm uh, Emma Smith, I'm a project manager with Empowered Conversations. That's a project of Age UK Salford and we deliver communication courses across Greater Manchester for family caregivers of people with dementia and we also offer one-to-one -one dementia specific uh, therapeutic support in, in Salford and since Covid we've been doing these in conversation with webinars so we were going to do a conference Kate and it didn't happen so we said let's do some um, webinars and it's just stuck since then so yeah, yeah we've, I don't know how many we've done but it's just a really nice way to meet people, share practice, nudge yeah. behaviour and um, so that's why we've been doing these. Terrific. Yeah, and, and we're really excited to find out about your work, Kate. So our plan for today is I'm going to hand over to Kate, who will share her work as a campaigner with you. Um, Kate and I will then have a little chat and then we'll pick up questions in the final part of the hour. Um, so if you haven't been on a webinar before, you shouldn't see yourselves. You should just see myself, Kate, and then occasional uh, part of the chat. <laughs> um, there's a QA and a um, section at the bottom so if at any point you want to um, write a question pop it in there we won't pick them up during the um, presentation but we'll pick them up at the end um, but just so that it stays fresh in your mind you can pop it in the Q&A at the bottom. I think that's all I need to say Kate. Okay to hand over to you. Yeah thank you well I'm going to share my screen and see how we go with um, my oh hang on I know we're being recorded. I'd better get the, the screen up. We even practiced this and then I still mucked it up. You'll be fine. Um, there you go. And just a funny story, really. I, I was planned to do this presentation um, last year, as some of you who registered then will know. And uh, I had done a full presentation ready for it. And then a few days ago, I thought, oh, gosh, I better do a presentation for today. So I completely redid another presentation. And then when I went to file it in my 2023 presentation folder, I found my old one. So um, I chose the less formal version. Um, so hopefully that's OK. Um, so it's terrific to be here. And thank you, Emma, for uh, inviting me to be in conversation with you. And thanks to those who've given up either the mornings or the afternoons or evenings to be here to tune in. It's terrific. So just, you probably don't need to know anything about the global data, but just really quickly, why part of why I do what I do is the 57 million people with dementia globally. Um, I focus on trying to improve outcomes for people through it, um, pushing for dementia to be seen and managed as a disability and so that we have equal access to the CRPD and also have uh, services such as rehabilitation provided for us soon after diagnosis. I think the stats are a bit, a, a bit distressing, seventh leading cause of death globally. In Australia and UK, it's, a, it's the second leading cause of death overall and the leading cause of death in women um, in Australia, I don't know about in other countries, it's predicted to become the leading death of men and women um, fairly soon, I think. So just a reminder that dementia is not only confusion and memory loss, there is a whole range of other symptoms um, and disabilities that people with dementia find. And I've unfortunately left a logo from another organisation on that slide, uh, but I didn't start out with memory loss at all, no changes to my memory. It was changes to things like my ability to spell words, to remember meanings of words, to do maths, for example. Um, so I, even though I worked in dementia as a nurse many years before, I actually had no idea that young people would get dementia. And I really only understood late stage dementia because they were the people that I'd nursed. Um, so I think a little bit of my own story, which some of you will have heard, Jane certainly has. Um, Dementia from the inside out, and, and Richard Taylor, the late Richard Taylor, um, used to give presentations about dementia from the inside out. And I think that what I thought I knew about dementia as a nurse and also as a family care partner 
is nothing like what it is to have dementia. And I felt like the, the minute I had the label of dementia on me, all that people saw were the missing bits, the deficits. Hence why I've put that slightly confronting image into my PowerPoint, um, because people stopped seeing me. They just saw the things I couldn't do. Um, and I, I'm a load of other things. So I still volunteer for the big issue. I used to be an operating nurse. I was a kid that grew up on a farm. I've done university degrees. I've got two fabulous sons who are actually about 10 or 11 years older than that photo. That was one of their 21st. I'm a wife. I'm a campaigner. I'm a whole host of things. But when you get dementia, all of those things are kind of thrown in the bin by society at large. And there are a few myths about dementia that I think people with dementia constantly um, talk about in, in private chat groups. You know, a lot of people have said to me, why did you bother getting diagnosed? There's nothing that can be done. Well, that you'd want to be diagnosed even if you had an in, untreatable cancer. So, of course, you need to be diagnosed. Dementia is not a normal part of ageing. We're not fading away or not all there. We're just changing People with dementia are changing in ways that you aren't. Um, the myth that we can't communicate with you, that we can't remember some things, and if we do, then we can't possibly have dementia. I've had that said to me so many times in 14 years. Um, and, and, and then, you know, if you're doing really well with cancer or another terminal disease, people would be thrilled for you. Or if you went into remission with cancer, people would be thrilled for you. But it seems that if you do too well with dementia, there's a group of people around the world who basically say, well, you can't possibly have dementia. Um, so they're wrong. And, uh, you know, everyone that's been told they've got dementia has been through a swag of tests to get that diagnosis, often multiple times. Um, the old myth that we don't feel pain is wrong. We can't speak or function. That's wrong. Um, and living positively some of the time with dementia is not possible, that's clearly wrong. There's just too many advocates around the world who are living, still having really bad days that they may not share, but living pretty productive lives. So, so when I was first diagnosed, it wasn't my treating specialist, neurologist, it was the healthcare and uh, advocacy organisations around me that afterwards told me to give up everything, to get my end of life affairs in order, I lost my job when I declared that I had dementia. Um, I had to sit a driving test a few months after my diagnosis and I failed miserably. Um, and I ended up calling that prescribed disengagement. So my doctor couldn't give me a drug that would help, that would modify my disease or even cure it. So they prescribed giving up. Everybody around me prescribed giving up on life. And the impact of that on me and my family was that we all lost hope for any sense of a future. But the other impact on care partners and families is that often in, in living with dementia courses, we're being told different things. And so they are told that they're soon going to have to take over. My husband was told he would soon have to give up work to take over doing for me. So that's very disempowering and disabling for the person with dementia. Um, so I ultimately trademarked that term um, and I think we have to fight against it um, really hard still because it's still happening to people with dementia. So I experienced, um, you know, what the late Dr. Martin Luther King talked about, that sense of nobodiness. Uh, I have sometimes felt treated like I wasn't a full human being and I feel like I much better understand um, how other marginalised groups feel Oh, sorry, my slides are flicking too quickly. I'll leave the mouse alone. Um, so I'm still here and I'm very different to the person I was 15 years ago and even to the person I was a year ago. But guess what? That was the same in when I was 20. I was really different by the time I was 21 or 27. Um, so to be kind of held to account for changing just because you've got dementia is pretty unfair to people with dementia and I still believe there's a systemic and gross underestimation of the capacity of all people with dementia, even in the later stages. Um, and a story of that as a young nurse, my first job after my training was to work in an aged care home. And um, at that time, people with dementia were shackled either to their beds or chairs. And 
one lady I was told not to waste my time on because she was mute um, and that to me meant I should spend more time with her. And after a few months of spending time with this lady and treating her just like I would treat any other, and, and back in the 70s people in nursing homes were called patients, now they're called residents in Australia at least, um, and I was in the washroom with her one day and, I don't know, any any nurses in the crowd here? Nurses are busy people. It's a hell of a job. And, I, you know, there was a lot to do that day and I said to this lady, oh, come on, um, I'll just call her Nellie for now. Um, come on, Nellie, can you cu- hurry up and have a wee? And she said to me with a wink, she said, you can go and have a wee for yourself. And I said to her, I, know, I knew you were in there. Why won't you speak to anybody out there? you know, on the floor. She said, they treat me like an idiot. Why would I waste my breath? So it was a really good lesson at the age of 20 to be able to have a conversation with a resident in a nursing home in quite late stage dementia who everybody else had said was mute. But the reason she wouldn't speak was because nobody was respecting her or valuing her. So it was a really good lesson to have early on. And I didn't realise that, you know, how much later on that might come to hand. Um, so since I've been diagnosed, I, I've started to take a rights-based approach. And this is just a you know a few of the violations of my rights. So not being able to continue to be employed in the job I was in, um, almost nobody would employ me now because I've got dementia. Um, I haven't had equal access to universal health coverage. I haven't had equal access to rehabilitation, Um, a whole range of things. And I I think that disability support is the one thing that's missing. I just happened to be a mature age student at a university when I was diagnosed. The healthcare sector told me to go home and get my end of life affairs in order and start going to daycare, respite, a day a month to get used to it. And the university sector said to me, I was simply a student with acquired disabilities that they could support to keep studying if that's what I wanted. So to me, I just cannot understand why the healthcare system doesn't yet do that. So I do like to acknowledge the pioneers and this um, presentation is partly about, you know, four decades of advocacy and maybe not too much changing yet. So I would like to honour the found the pioneer advocates. Um, so there's an organisation that is no longer, uh, doesn't have a website anymore even, but 12 people with dementia um, founded an organisation called DASNI, Dementia Advocacy and Support Network. It really was the first group of people with dementia, glo- a global group. Um, they also had carers who were full members Um, And they were very active. They worked with um, uh, the author of the book, uh, Steel Alice. You know, they did all sorts of things long before the last 15 years of advocates that I've um, come to know and respect. And many of them, you know, are very good friends of mine. But they, they borrowed the motto from the disability community of nothing about us without us. Um. And I, I haven't, couldn't get a picture of all 12 of them, um, but Peter Ashley was was probably the first dementia advocate, self-advocate in England. I, I may be wrong. Christine Bryden was diagnosed with young onset, I think Alzheimer's originally when she was 46, and I'm pretty sure she was the first advocate here in Australia. Um, Jeannie Lee is, is still living in Hawaii. She was diagnosed a long time ago, and I, I don't know whether... Um, some of the other members of DASNI uh, are still with us, but there was a pretty good group of people um, that did some incredible work. So um, we mustn't forget that they started this process of advocacy and whatever advocacy we do today, whatever wins or losses we have, we wouldn't be as far as we are without those early advocates Um so why uh, one of my big questions is why do advocates have to keep repeating the same thing? So Christine Bryden, um, James McKillop from Scotland, um, Peter Ashley, the late Richard Taylor, um, when he was with DAI, 
they were all talking for basically Article 19 of the CRPD, which was inclusion. And the language that advocates use now may be much, you know, a little bit more um, uh, based around rights, but really we're, we're still asking for the same thing. We're still asking for equal inclusion. We're still asking for healthcare. We're still asking for support. So it, it bothers me that we have to keep asking the same thing over and over and over. We're still asking for respectful language in the media uh, and in with some researchers. So it, there's so many things that when I started as an advocate, I thought, wow, I'm going to change the world. And then a few years down the track, I met all these people who'd been saying the same thing as me for 10 or 15 or 20 years before me. That's a bit downheartening, actually, to think that you just have to keep repeating yourself. So... After DASNI, two years after DASNI, or yes, two years, um, the Scottish Dementia Working Group, which was inspired by pioneer self-advocate James McKillop, um, who he loves to introduce himself as being diagnosed in the last century. Um, and, and the Scottish Dementia Working Group was founded in 2022. It's funded by Alzheimer's Scotland and the Scottish Government. At least it was then. I'm not sure now. But the reason they founded that was James and Heather were both questioning why there was a voice for carers and professionals, but not for people with dementia. And it was also James who suggested to Alzheimer's Europe that they set up a working group. But I think that was one of the things that initially inspired me to speak up because I, I in Australia, we had quite a lot of um, consumer advisory groups and some of them didn't have any people with dementia, but usually there was a token, one or two of us, and when I met the Scottish Dementia Working Group in 2012 at the ADI conference in London, and that was their 10th birthday party, I came back to Australia um, pretty much determined and nagging, I suppose. I was nagging um, the CEO at the time, Glenn Rees, to set up a group just of people with dementia um, because I was wondering the same. Why are all the people speaking, all the consumers People with dementia or all carers, they're always, they were always carers. They weren't people with dementia. And so I think the pendulum went too far the other way for a while and it was only people with dementia being invited to speak. And now we do need a balance because it's really important that both voices um, are always heard. So that there's lots of dementia advisory or working groups around the world. I probably haven't listed them all. Um, but DASNI was the first one. Um, the Scottish Dementia Working Group was the next one. Um, there was, an, I think, an English Dementia Working Group. I'm not sure whether it was called UK or English Dementia Working Group that Peter Ashley was involved in um, that was not active when I became an advocate. Um, and, and you can read that list. I don't need to go through that. But um, it's interesting to see all of these Dementia Working Group or Dementia Advisory Groups um, all over the world now, but still we haven't got much change. So that really worries me as an advocate and that old saying, if you're happy, keep doing what you're always doing, but you're, if you're not happy with something, if you keep doing what you're always doing, you're just going to get the same. And I, I've decided I needed to think differently about advocacy. And I think that due to prescribed disengagement, having your life stripped away from you, all of your dreams, all of your hope taken away from you. Advocacy, if you get involved in it, brings back a meaningful, purposeful life and you don't want to give it up. It's really hard to pass the banner to new advocates because you don't want to lose your new unpaid job because it's given you a reason to get out of bed again. But are advocates being involved as equal? Is our inclusion equitable? I don't think so yet. Um, because I have attended meetings all over the world for the last 10, 12, 15 years, however long it is, and usually I'm the only one at the table who's not even paid for my time or expertise to be there. So it's not yet equitable. Often I've had to pay my own way to be somewhere, and I hear that still a lot from advocates. Um, so as we endeavour to increase the number of people to become advocates, because the voices of people with dementia are important, we must also learn to pass the baton to make sure we empower new advocates, new leadership, new speaking roles. 
And this is even more critical because we are people living with a terminal illness and with changing capacity. Um, the other thing that does drive me nuts is the, the constant silos that people all over the world just developing new new dementia organisations and everyone's vying for the same money. So advocacy itself starts to become competitive because without money you can't do it um, instead of active advocacy. So that you know that's something else that worries me that I think about a lot and I don't know the answers to some of my queries and worries but they're things that I'm thinking about. So I, I, I also wonder, has the increased involvement of unpaid advocates caused further harm and further stigma? It certainly caused what I call economic stigma. Before dementia, I was paid for my work. Since dementia, nobody wants to pay me for my work. So it's a bit like slave labour. And if I've had a lot to do with groups of other groups of disabled people um, around the world and they've been campaigning for fair and equal wages for their work, even as consumers, for a long, long time. But the disability community generally still often doesn't represent people with disabilities due to dementia. So that, that is um, a, a task that dementia advocates probably need to get active in. And it is really good to note that Dementia Australia, not so long ago, recently introduced some sitting fees for people with dementia and care partners who are involved in, in I don't know whether it's advocacy or specific projects, but that's such a positive step. So well done, Dementia Australia. But what does the evidence tell us about the change? People often say to me, oh, well, there's heaps of change. You know, you advocates have made a lot of change. We may have, may have changed people's attitudes, but we haven't done much in terms of changing practice. So the last three or four ADI World Alzheimer's reports and various research projects, including the Cognizance Project, which was a five country project looking at the immediate post diagnostic pathway for people with dementia, they all found that it's very hard to get a timely, accurate diagnosis of dementia. There are still hardly any post diagnostic supports or services. People with dementia don't often don't even get told dementia causes disabilities. So we don't get assessed for disabilities like we would if we lost our legs in a car accident, for example, or had a stroke. Um, and we're not told that the symptoms are acquired disabilities. Uh, enabling environments are not common yet. Um, and people who need assisted living arrangements are almost always institutionalised and then people with dementia are further segregated and in Australia, we've had 20 formal inquir government inquiries and a royal commission that has proven over and over and over again that people living in residential aged care in Australia continue to experience multiple forms of abuse, neglect and human rights violations, including an estimated 50 sexual assaults a week in residential aged care. So that's pretty sobering evidence about how people with dementia are not being served well enough. So in 2023, and bear in mind I was diagnosed in 2008, I've only met one person in all of that time with dementia who wasn't advised to prepare for the end and to give up their pre-diagnosis life. Um, rehabilitation and other enabling post-diagnostic services are still not being provided unless you can fund it yourself or with a bit of a fight. Um, and we're not provided with disability assessment. And I'm still finding way too many events about dementia where there is nobody with dementia attending or speaking. So I think that by reimagining and reframing dementia as a condition causing disabilities, we can reinforce the rights of people with dementia um, under the CRPD, but it also gives people with dementia and their families uh, much more hope of accessing rehabilitation beyond basic continence management, swallowing issues, which, you know, most of the speech therapists here are more focused on end of life speech therapy for people with dementia, which is actually a bit late for people who are having trouble with speech because of having aphasia. Um, and, and, basically assessments of them 
more about just activities of daily living. Can you make a cup of tea? Not can we support you to keep working or to keep volunteering and to keep living your pre-diagnosis life if that's what you want. So, I mean, dementia is one of the major causes of disability. The WHO has listed that for a very long time. Apologies for the spelling mistake in organisation. Um, and we have all sorts of disability support for other people, hearing loops, um, wheelchair access, uh, support for people with vision impairment. Um, there is a communication access course in an organisation called Scope in Australia. That's their logo up there, the two arrows. Um, I think that every organisation that supports people with dementia who usually have some form of communication um, disabilities should be doing that course. It's available, it, uh, it's been launched for years and I, I don't know of any dementia organisations yet who do that. So if we compare, if I, age 49 when I was diagnosed, I know as a past nurse, if I'd had a stroke or a brain injury from some other, you know, from trauma, um, I know how I would have been managed. I would have been sent to rehabilitation and supported to go back to work, if possible, with disability support. Instead, with dementia, I was just told to go home and get ready for the end. Um, I, I went to the um, mental health or the rehabilitation forum in um, Geneva in 2019, and one of the physicians um, put this great quote up on a slide, and he said, I keep the patients alive. Rehabilitation gives them quality of life. And I absolutely agree with that. And, you know, we have to keep campaigning for rehab for dementia. And it's fantastic the World Health Organization um, has or is, is almost finished developing their technical guidelines for rehabilitation for people with dementia. So it, it's happening, but it's going to take time to embed into practice. So these are some of the things that I've done to, I call it the Olympics of my life. And it's almost a full-time job. Um, some of those things, I go to rehab four or five days a week, um, exercise physiologist, a whole range of things. So there's a whole range of things that I've been doing for a long time, but I'm in a lucky position where I could afford to do them. Many, many people with dementia don't have the resources to be able to do that for themselves and our healthcare system doesn't yet provide a lot of or even refer you to a lot of those things. So positive outcomes of rehabilitation, reablement and reimagining dementia are improved quality of life and well-being um, and reducing the human and economic costs of dementia um, and also increased dependence. It's not a cure, but we can maybe be independent for longer and hopefully not that I would normally use the word burden, but it shows up everywhere in the literature that people with dementia are a burden um, so hopefully we could inc would decrease that, that burden to families, but also to the community and to governments. So COVID came along, I don't know, three years ago, two and a half years ago, whenever it was. And we started seeing in the news, at least in Australia, you probably did in the UK or wherever you're from in this webinar, all sorts of people who are being um, made to isolate at home, uh, we're experiencing lots of these different behavioural and psychological symptoms that I've called it of COVID, BPSC. Um, but they were seen as reasonable human responses to a really difficult situation or time in our life. You know, I can remember see, seeing images on TV of people spitting on food in a supermarket or, you know, with a huge trolley load of toilet paper. Um, so if you had dementia and you were doing that, it would be a very different story. You would be labelled as having BPSD or whatever the new latest fancy term is, challenging behaviours, uh, behaviours of concern, unmet needs. It's, be, you know, it's being renamed to potentially make it more palatable but to me it still is doing harm so these are all the reasonable responses to lots of things that happen when you've got dementia they're not necessarily due to the pathology of dementia 
um, and I had a lovely interview with Kellen, Dr. Kellen Lee a couple of days ago about her work with material citizenship. Um, and if you haven't done any of her courses, I absolutely recommend you do because her courses basically and her material citizenship, citizenship theories basically really challenge BPSD as well. So um, we do need to make some changes about that. I did a list of the uh, symptoms of dementia versus the symptoms of COVID. And actually, there's a whole lot more um, from COVID. So, so maybe, maybe we've really got to reframe how we think about people with dementia. And I've written a lot about normal human responses um, to things that happen to people with dementia. And, and one of these days, I'll reactivate a banned BPSD campaign. I'm not sure when, but maybe. So I, I did say to um, Emma that I possibly would be uh, a bit provocative, but one of the people who was registered to, to attend this last year had specifically asked me to talk about uh, my view on the dementia-friendly initiatives. And I am not so sure that they're friendly. Um, I think if we believe a human rights approach is the way forward, for people with dementia, then we have to consider this question. Is it okay to continue with initiatives such as dementia-friendly communities or dementia villages that continue to segregate and where people with dementia are labelled by their disease and disability and not equally included? And when I say that, I mean they're not paid to be involved in these initiatives. So if we were running in Australia, if we were having an Aboriginal friendly community uh, project and didn't employ First Nations Australians to work in those initiatives, everyone would be outraged. And so I'm really confused about why people aren't outraged that people with dementia aren't being employed to work in these dementia friendly initiatives. Instead, it's people without dementia who are flying around the world attending conferences uh, as the experts of dementia-friendly communities. So I just have to keep questioning that. Um, I don't know what the answer is, but I think the way it's, it's very popular, um, but I'm not sure it's the right way forward. So I think labels aren't really for people. Um, and I know lots of people with dementia who say they don't get involved in the dementia friendly community initiatives because to do that means they have to out themselves as having dementia and some of them don't want to so i, I would love to see that whole paradigm change to inclusive communities so they're inclusive for everyone young mothers with pram people in a wheelchair people with dementia people with autism we need them to be inclusive for everybody and not necessarily label so when you look at it like this, it made more sense to me when I did this. So labelling by disease or disability is not okay for other cohorts, but it's very popular for people with dementia. So if we replace the signs on that shopping um, uh, signage with dementia village, leprosy village, cancer village, schizophrenia village, bipolar village, AIDS village, etc., you get my drift. We don't isolate people with any other condition in a village. So a village might be better than a secure locked unit, which my father-in-law always called jail. Why have you put me in jail every time we went to visit him? But it's still a form of segregation. So I, I'm confused about why we as a society have I haven't, but why most of society has fallen in love with dementia-friendly initiatives because I think they're so wrong. Um, I, it's just very quickly, uh, Dementia Alliance International, we had our, uh, our ninth birthday was actually the 1st of January this year, um, but we had our birthday cafe today uh, at 9 o'clock this morning, my time. Um, so we started, uh, eight of us started Dementia Alliance International because we were tired of there being no services for us um, 
and that group has grown. It, it's been up and down the last couple of years, had lots of struggles with new leadership and people leaving and, uh, you know, new new board members. Um, but, you know, we focus on seeing the person, not the dementia, and on providing free membership and free support through peer-to-peer -peer support groups and um, the introduction of cafes again, which used to be monthly um, this year. So uh, that's what DAI does. Um, but let's rock the dementia boat together because if we keep working in silos, we'll probably hinder the progress of the much needed change. Um, I think that's all I want to say for today. Um, I'd love to take questions and thank you for listening. Thanks, Kate. I feel like I just need to go. Ooh. 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 I <laughs> so crammed in a lot. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, but it was just all so fascinating. But ooh, I'm glad that we're recording this and um, I can watch it back just to absorb some more. So you can drop your questions in the Q&A at the bottom. Wow. And I will provide you with a PDF of the slides too if there's a if you would like to add them to your wherever you put the video. Oh yeah. Yeah. I haven't done that before, but that'd be great. Thank you. Kate. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Something new. So in all of that, one of the questions that was sort of going around in my head was, you know, it feels like you get a lot from advocacy, but if you're not seeing much change, what keeps you energized to get out there and keep pushing um me personally i've really changed the way that i advocate um i because i have quite a different viewpoint on some topics such as dementia friendly uh, i i'm often actively excluded from meetings in within the advocacy space um others will be invited to participate in cons consultations, but there ha have been times over the years where I've been actively excluded uh, because dementia-friendly communities, for the awareness that it may or may not be raising, is still very much a money maker for organisations. And, you know, the advocates who get in, and I was employed by Dementia Australia on a contract basis when they were first developing them here, and even though I said at the time, I wish we could call them inclusive communities, um, there was already too much money invested in dementia-friendly community initiatives. And all over the world now, people have invested money in dementia-friendly communities. It's probably never going to die a death in my life. Um, but the advocates who do get involved in them, and not all of them include advocates, not all everywhere can find an advocate who's able or willing. Um, the advocates, when I was doing it, it was great because I was engaged. I was meeting people. I was doing something that I thought would make a big difference. But, you know, since 2013, I haven't seen any difference in the community. And if, and if you look at all the surveys that are done about stigma or attitudes towards people with dementia or dementia knowledge, Actually, we're not getting any new results. They're pretty much the same as they were 10 years ago. So if we can't be really honest and look at the evidence and go, well, maybe they're not working. So I, I've just had to change the way. I, I appreciate that lots of other advocates are really committed to doing advocacy their way. And, you know, this is my way. What's your way? There is no wrong way. Um, I just have felt so disheartened and dissatisfied. And then, you know, and I talked to long-term advocates like James McKillop or Christine Bryden and, yeah, I go, my God, we're asking the same thing over and over and over and over again. And I, so, I, you know, I'm moving away into different ways to advocate like writing or um, maybe yeah. research projects. I've been involved in a few different research projects. Um, and stepping away more and more from um, active advocacy, shall we call it, the current style of advocacy. And, I, you know, I'm not saying it's wrong. I don't know. I just know it's not really working. Otherwise, when I meet a new DAI member who just got their diagnosis in the last three or six months, if it, maybe my litmus test is too high, but my litmus test is that one day I'll meet a newly diagnosed person 
who didn't go home and think it was the end and who were actually provided with referrals to real support. That's when I'll feel like my advocacy is a success. So maybe the bar is too high and, you know, we're always our own worst, um, you know, we judge ourselves harshly usually. Um, but that's kind of my litmus test and probably it's because through DAI I meet lots of newly diagnosed people um, and, you know, new websites are set up all the time but a new website doesn't give me any service. It might give me information but there's so much information out there already I'm actually confused about the information on websites. Um, so people with dementia and our care partners and families we actually need services, real services, and, and forget COVID. We need face-to-face -face services and we need rehab and we need speech therapy and we need face-to-face -face support groups or online support groups. Um, and a new website doesn't do that. No, no, it doesn't at all. I mean, you talked about stigma there. Do you feel that there's no change at all around stigma in the last 14, 15 years since you've been... None whatsoever. And if you look at all the surveys that organisations like ADI have done for their World Alzheimer's reports, um, they're coming up with the same results they came up with 10 years ago. So so any, anyone here who's a researcher, go and do a liter literature review on stigma and dementia because it's glaringly obvious that there's been almost no change. Why do you think that is? Uh, gee, that's a tricky question, knowing that I'm being recorded. Um, I think there is still too much paternalism, even by staff in healthcare and within advocacy organisations. There is some of those myths that I talked about are still really holding us back, um, Lots of other reasons probably, but, you know, when you're given a diagnosis of a condition where you and your family advise there's nothing that can be done and to go home and prepare, get your end of life affairs in order, and then the narrative that follows that is consistently that, um, you know, the, the doing for us still seems to many people the right way rather than, you know, if if you or I or anyone in the Zoom room today had a child with disability, would we keep doing for them or would we encourage them to do for themselves with help if needed? Um, of course, we, we would encourage them to do for themselves. And I think that too often, you know, I've speak and spoken to a lot of people with dementia and their family member, partner, care partner, um, when they do the courses, when they're first diagnosed, we're told we're not changing, they're told we are changing and they'll soon have to take over. And so they do what they're told, which actually further disempowers us. And then lots of us, you know, lots of people with dementia take on learned helplessness, which you see a lot with kids. Um, and, you know, I've been to consultations, many of them over the years, and they might be mixed consultations, tables of eight or ten, and everyone's asked to contribute to questions. The people with dementia, apart from in the earlier days, it was usually only me that contributed. And then, But in the coffee break or the lunch break, the, the person with dementia, the other people with dementia, would, were talking to me just like I'm talking to you now, and I'll say to them, so, so why don't you speak up in the consultation? And they'd say, oh, I can't be bothered. I'll be corrected on the way home. I'll be told I was too slow or I might get my words mixed up and so I'll get embarrassed. You know, all these, you know, less and less and less able to do for self because of all of those barriers. Yeah, almost that. It's that disempowered environment. So if that if they knew that they could speak and people would listen and they would, they would you know, even if they took their time or if they got a word wrong, it wouldn't matter. They wouldn't be corrected. But just that patience. Yeah, so if we had a child with cerebral palsy, would we keep correcting them? No, of course not. So why do we do that to people with dementia? Jane said, do you think 
a lot of the stigma, et cetera, might be because there are still so many things we don't know about the diseases causing dementia. Um, I'm not sure, Jane, about that. Uh, I think it's due to 20th century attitudes still and still thinking, you know, the therapeutic nihilism around dementia is so high, there's nothing you can do, so we won't do anything. And, uh, you know, if you go into a care home, you don't have the opportunity to do for yourself. That's all taken away. Um, you know, usually you can't even choose what time of day you have a shower. Um, so I, I don't think it's to do with uh, the things we don't know about dementia. I think it's to do with the things we're not willing yet to change within ourselves and how we treat people who are other than us. So it's, it, you know, and that affects a lot of different groups, not just people with dementia. I noticed that. Veronica, um... Veronica's just said I verbalised perfectly everything she's been thinking since working with people with diagnosis. Well, that's great. Thank you, Veronica. We've got a question as well from, uh, oh, Rebecca said, I like the idea of dementia rehabilitation rather than support. And I know what you mean about competing dementia services. It's frustrating. This has been fascinating. I was thinking, you know, on your, the, the steps that you take around your own rehabilitation and you said um, counselling around grief and loss and with a lot of the other health conditions, counselling would be part and parcel of what you always offered, yeah but not with dementia not for the mm. not for the person with dementia not for the caregiver um there's there's counseling for the care families of people with dementia in australia now and courses for them apparently um but certainly not for us we would have to self-fund that think of doing it and self-fund that and i think the only reason so in my book that i first wrote what the hell happened to my brain um I don't know, published a few years ago, I, probably my longest chapter in that book was about grief. And that's partly because I had been a volunteer um, grief support worker for people bereaved through suicide. I'd lost a partner to suicide when I was 27 and then became involved in, in what was the first um, support group for people bereaved through suicide. And it was peer to peer support. So, I, you know, it was sort of ahead of our time in a way. And, and was the, it's, still in operation, which is fantastic. So that that was founded in uh, 1986 and I was the chair from 1986 to 1995, something like that. So we ran twice monthly in-person support groups for people bereaved through suicide, plus we had a 24-7 helpline. And, and I started to think about dementia and I used to have a photographic memory. I really miss that. And I grieved for it, and but nobody told me that I had a right to grieve for it. You know, if I was, I'm sure if I was in a nursing home and I was laying on the bed sobbing because I was feeling grief about having lost another function, then I'd probably be medicated. I'd certainly be labelled as having some, you know, disturbing behaviour. But when I was involved in the grief, grief space, and I think I would love some research done on this, but I haven't got time for that. Um, so any researchers there who want a new project, I would love you to look at the impact of grief and if grief counselling was provided to people with dementia very early on, as it is if you're told you've got cancer or motor neurone disease or any of those other terminal illnesses, just how much of that hopelessness might disappear and the anxiety might not ever appear and depression is a normal part of grief. So that might go away if we actually dealt with the grief. And a GP friend of mine who was working with the Breathe Through Suicide Support Group, she actually went away and did a PhD to develop a, a grief assessment tool for general practitioners, which I don't know if I ever made it into practice but it was for her as a GP to determine whether her client had a depressive illness or whether her client had depression caused through some grief experience. And if she assessed the grief experience, she could then treat that client with grief counselling and usually never had to put them on antidepressants. So I, I would love to see that type of research done in dementia 
you know, I was in the UK maybe at a conference, but we'd also spent some time visiting friends or family. And we'd been to Italy for two or three days to see a concert up at La Scala. And it was one of my favourite composers. And when we were there, I didn't recognise who I was listening to. Had no, once I could have told you that was such and such a conduct, conductor in such and such a concert hall even. And I, I didn't even know we were listening to Marla. And so my husband, thinking he was doing the right thing, booked us to go to another concert the next night. And, and I think it was Mozart. I couldn't tell the difference. I had no idea whether they were the same or not. And I probably spent six weeks in quite deep grief over that because having had that deep knowledge of classical music and suddenly having it like thrown down my throat that I could no longer remember music. Um, I can't remember composers. I can't remember. You know, Pete would say, well, why don't you set up a playlist on your phone? I said, I would love to, but I can't remember what I like. So that's complicated. Um, so I, I've got a free app. It was a birthday present for one of my sons, actually, called Shazam. So I go, oh, I know that music or I like that music. I Shazam it and add it to my playlist. But other than that, I, I can't tell you what music I'm listening to anymore. So, you know, there's grief around that. But nobody, you know, the fact that I can't spell well anymore and have to rely on, you know, I had a near perfect ability to spell and to do maths and now I can't even use a calculator. I mean, I used to fight against the calculator and then I, in the end I just went, stop wasting two hours, send your husband an email and ask him to do the calculation. You know, I wear reading glasses. What's wrong with asking somebody else to help me with maths now? But it takes a long time to get through that sadness of losing capacity before you can come around to, you know, I can understand why older people who are forced to use Webster packs and forced to use all these aids get angry because you know, they've had a longer life than me where they were confident and capable and ran their homes and brought up their kids and probably half of them helped bring up grandkids and suddenly, you know, they need help to make a cup of tea. No wonder they get upset about that and maybe if they got more grief support they wouldn't get quite so annoyed about the changes happening to them. Thanks, Kate. Claire said, do you think the rehabilitation model in the widest sense needs to change as people with dementia do not currently fit the model resulting in therapeutic nihilism? Um, I think that's slowly going to change, Claire. Um, uh, and little bits of rehab are being rolled out around the world. Um, uh, I've forgotten of the academic in England who's doing cognitive rehabilitation um, but little bits of pockets of rehabilitation are starting to happen I'm involved um, as a investigator with a research project at Monash University here in Australia about uh, embedding rehabilitation into dementia care so you know that's going to be a process you doctors still think mostly it's a waste of time and we've done surveys on attitudes to dementia um, even lots of people around me have said I don't know why you bother with all this exercise and, you know, change of diet and change of lifestyle and all the things that I do, why do you bother? Because dementia is going to get you in the end. Well, hey, I was born with a death sentence. You were too. So why should I have to lay down and die? Um, and, you know, the challenge of refusing to go home and wait to die is that then you get the doubters that you even have dementia who in England are pretty vocal too. So, you know, I really feel for the advocates in England. Um, and it's just not okay to be publicly disputing someone's diagnosis of anything. No, it's not, Kate. Mm. We're, we're at nine o'clock over at UK time. And I, and I know that you've got a swimming pool calling you because it's <laughs> ridiculous temperature over there and you've got your family there. Kate, it was absolutely fascinating. I feel like we scratched the surface and at some point, if you have got the time, we would like to come back for another conversation. It feels like there's so much more that we could talk about. Um, thank you so much. Someone's just popped in there. So yeah, interesting. I'd love to come back um, anytime. So let, let's do it later in the year. I think the, the, the work around grief, that's an area that we're um, working on at the moment. So that might be really interesting, Kate. Yeah. Okay. So I, I did a, 
uh, graduate diploma in grief. So I've got pretty good knowledge of grief still. And, you know, I think that's probably was one of the lucky straws I drew. I was at uni when I got diagnosed. I had knowledge of grief and loss counselling. And so they were two really helpful things um, to help me keep living instead of go home and give up. But thank, thank you, everyone, for um, being here to listen. Barbara said thank you. There's so much to think about. Really inspirational, Kate. Absolutely fantastic. I am going to have to watch it a few times just to take it all in because there was just so much in there. Um, and I'd love to just carry on having a conversation with you over the next few years, if that's okay. Terrific. Look forward Thanks. to it. Okay. Enjoy Thanks, everyone. Pool. Yeah, bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.